Well, good morning on this beautiful Lord's Day. Amen. Showers of blessing. He's brought us some rain, and I tell you what, we're blessed to be here today. And we need to never take that for granted that we was able to get up this morning. He provided us a, a house to live in, a way to travel, shoes on our feet, clothes on our back, and everything we have is by him. And ain't nothing we've done. It's all by his marvelous grace and mercy. Can you say amen to that? Amen. I appreciate each and every one being here today. I uh, just welcome you here to Emmanuel Baptist Church. If you visit us this morning, please feel free to fill out a visitor's card at the Welcome Center. they got a little bag there back for you. Fill out one of those little visitor's cards if you would. And we'd love to talk to you more about our church if you've got questions. If you don't have a home church, we'd love to have you here at Emmanuel Baptist Church. And just pray about it and seek God's will as we go forward for his honor and glory in the Lord. Amen? Amen. With that said, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you once again for another day for allowing us to be back into your house, Lord. Father, we thank you, Lord, for just providing a place once again that we can come and let us never take that for granted, Lord. And I thank you for each individual that has came out to your house this morning, Lord. I pray for each family here today, Father. I pray for each individual here today, Lord. If, Father, if there's a need, Lord, in their life, Father, Lord, that, uh, that is burdening them down, Lord, I just pray today, Father, they just give it all to you, Lord. And above all, Lord, I pray today, if there's one here today that has questions about their salvation, that has never received you as their personal Savior, I pray today would be the day of salvation. Father, we want to lift up all those on our prayer request list. And as I look around, I just give you praise now, Father, for all those that you've touched, Lord, that has been sick in the past weeks and months and had procedures done, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for that. And Lord, we want to lift those up to you now, especially even Tina now, Father. We thank you for your hand upon her, Lord, that, Father, she wouldn't hurt no worse than she was. And we thank you. Just heal her. She's at home now. And, Father, uh, all those, Lord, that we've mentioned this past week, Lord, we have so many, but you continue to work in a great and mighty way. Father, we just pray that your will will be done today, Father, in the songs that are sung and the messages that are brought, Lord, that you get honor and glory for it all because it's about you and only you. And we just thank you and ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. If you got your bulletin, several announcements, of course, tonight. Uh, we'll be having special music tonight. That'll be, be Damascus Ridge Bluegrass Gospel Singers. So please come out tonight for that. That'll be at 6 o'clock. Uh, bring someone out for that. Also, homemade cookie donations are needed to be given out to first, respondal, re, first responders. Any variety and quantity are welcome. Please bring your cookies to the church Saturday, February the 4th at 10 a.m. Also, Tree of Life Heart Songs Homecoming 2023, that'll be the February the 3rd and the 4th. That'll be at Lumberton, uh, several gospel groups, some that have been here before. They'll be there, free admission. There's a sign-up sheet in the Welcome Center. Uh, see Robbie uh, if you got any questions on that, Robbie Tyner. Uh, if you'd like to make a monetary donation for the Sunrise Service Breakfast, that'll be coming up soon. Uh, we're almost here at uh, February already. On April tonight, uh, just see me or Bubba or Lita concerning that if you'd like to make a donation for that uh, sunrise breakfast that morning. There, there's a Potter's Hand meeting tonight at 5 p.m., so remember that. The Sweetheart Banquet is set Saturday, February the 11th from 5 to 7 p.m. There'll be a sign-up sheet. Uh, it's in the Welcome Center, so if you want to come to our Sweetheart Banquet and uh, just sign up for that, uh, all are welcome there. And then also, uh, no adult choir practice this evening because of our special singing tonight. Uh, youth leaders, that's all the youth leaders uh, that are interested, looking to try to get our kids uh, to the camp, in a camp this year. Uh, they'll be meeting this afternoon at 5.15. If you got an interest in that, uh, you can ask Robbie more about it uh, concerning that. So we're going to try to get that lined up and get that in motion because that'll be here before you know it. So just remember that. And then also our next Brotherhood meeting uh, it'll be March the 25th, the March the 25th of men. Uh, mark your calendars for that. Uh, we're going to invite other men from other churches for that event. So just remember that, March the 25th. That'll be for our brotherhood evening. We'll have a good time of fellowship, food, devotion, and, and a few special songs to be sung. So just remember that. Is there anything I might have missed? Uh, a lot going on. Okay. Bit. Yes, business meeting. Business meeting will be uh, February the 1st, so remember that. That'll be our uh, quarterly business meeting, so just remember that. That'll be on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. All right. Is that it? All right, I believe the choir at this time has got a song.
As the choir comes down, I believe we've got a congregational hymn lined up here. We're going to sing, there we go, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. It's hymn number 232 if you want to find it. have the ushers come forward for the morning offering. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is, I'm so thankful for that grace.
Here, Brother John. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your grace. Where in the world would we be, would be without your grace and your mercy in our lives, Lord? We thank you, Lord. Thank you for the people that are here today. Thank you for the ones that are out and help, that hopefully get better, Lord. We know we got a lot of sickness. Lord, we ask you to be with our pastor today as he brings the message. Lord, I just thank you, Lord, that we've got a Bible that tells us the truth of God. And Lord, we ask you to be in this offering. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you notice out here in the backyard, there's been some work done. So kids, please stay out of that mud out there because it's going to be wet and slick for a while. We thought we had a septic system problem out there, and it still might be. We did find a busted water line. So that busted water line, we're hoping that was the problem, the reason the ground was being wet. So that's been fixed and taken care of. A French drain put in around the building to get the water away from that. And now, with uh, I know we've got several parents in here with younger kids. If you would, please uh, give me some advice or us some, some concerns or wants that you're thinking about playground. Thoughts on that, uh, families with young'uns. Uh, see me or one of the deacons, and we're going to try to move forward with that as soon as things dry up and clear up just a little bit. Amen? All right. Well, this time we have some special music. I believe Brother Rob, you're going to come up and share with us. And after the special music, Children's Church will be dismissed. should change to trade our old time religion for something new our faith is outdated while living the past well my answer is simple so if you ask I still love to hear how God's love paid the cost was fast and my nails to a cross I still love the sound as the saints 
start to sing songs of the blood Jesus shed just for me. I still love it all to where a broken ones pray and find what is found in no other way. It may be old fashioned, but it's real. Stay on the old path Brought us this far To save countless millions To reach hardened hearts Although times are changing And forever will There'll still be one Savior One Calvary's hill I still love to hear God's love paid the cost Passion was fastened by nails to a cross I still love the sound as the saints start to sing Songs of the blood Jesus shed just for me I still love an altar where broken ones pray Find what is found in no other way It made me all was fastened by nails to a cross I still love the sound as the saints start to sing songs of the blood Jesus shed just for me I still love an altar where broken ones pray to find what is found in no other way it may be old fashioned but it's real
thank you, Robbie and Jenny. And I know there's plenty of others in this church that can sing too. They need to get up here and sing. Amen. There's a lot of talent. Don't just sit on the pew. Don't waste that because you don't know how you can touch somebody's heart by singing. Children's Church, 5 to 7, dismissed at this time. 5 to 7. Any kids going back this morning? Any kids going back this morning? Right over there in that corner. John, you got it this morning? Okay. All right. Well, as much as the comments I got on last week's message, and it was a great service, and all, it was God's hand, it all was, probably going to get just as many comments today about this ain't the greatest message. But it's got to be preached. It's got to be preached because God's been dealing my heart with it. See a lot of it in churches today. That thought today I want you to think about is the gift of mercy. The gift of mercy. We're going to look in three different passages this morning. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 9. If you want to turn your Bibles to there, we're going to look at a few verses there. Matthew chapter 9. We'll come back to a few of these passages later in the message. Matt, yes. All right, brother. I was standing back there, and I heard this song about grace and mercy. I changed a bit broken, and then Pastor Mike talked about the mercy right here. I see my brother troubled. I see my brother troubled. You know, we all, as a church, Throw stuff on our pastor's shoulders. And he has to try to carry it. I want to anoint you this morning that God will set you free. I want you to be anointed this morning by the Holy Spirit that God will set you free. Amen, brother. I appreciate it. If y'all join me up here, we're going to anoint our pastor. And I want the whole church to pray over this man that God will set him free. That his chains are going to be broken. These things that we try to cast upon him to pull him down, he's going to be set free from it this morning. And he's going to be at liberty to preach the word the way God wants him to. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And I just want to be obedient to God in doing this. Thank you, brother. Pastor Mike, we want to anoint you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes, Lord. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we bow before your throne this morning, heavenly Father. Lord, I ask you, Lord, just to touch my pastor, the shepherd of this flock, heavenly Father. Lord, that you set him free this morning, heavenly Father. Lord, that he would have liberty to preach and, and, that, and just deliver that word that you've laid upon his heart, heavenly Father. Lord, we just thank you for this man of God, heavenly Father, for what he stands for. Lord, the enemy is trying to attack, Father, and we just rebuke it right now in Jesus' name, Heavenly Father. Lord, just touch our, our shepherd, Heavenly Father, the shepherd of this flock. Help us to stand behind him, Heavenly Father, and give him that that he needs right now, Lord. Lord, we thank you. Father, we praise you. Father, we're going to glorify you now in this word. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you, brothers. Thank you, brothers. Thank you. And all of God's children said, Amen. 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 We're in Matthew chapter 9, then we'll, we'll be at Matthew chapter 12, and then we'll be at Matthew chapter 23. I generally don't do that, but in today's uh, message, I feel like the Lord, that's where we're leaving. So we're going to start off here in Matthew chapter 9. I don't get to preach tonight, so you get it this morning. So, Amen. Just let the Lord have His will and way. We see Matthew here in verse 9, it says, And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of customs, and he saith unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. Verse 10, And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, and when the Pharisees saw it, and when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? I thank the Lord today that I have a heavenly father, that he came and sat with an old sinner. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that my Lord is not a, wasn't a Pharisaical man. I'm thankful for that. Verse 12, But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, 
that they be, uh, be whole need, not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. That's Jesus speaking there. And I love this. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Key verse, key words there. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And then flip over to chapter 12 if you got your Bibles. We're going to look at a few verses there. We'll look at more of this passage here in just a few minutes, but flip on down to uh, verse 6 of chapter 12. If you dare say amen. But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Do you see that repeated, those phrases right there twice in those two passages back over in chapter 9 and uh, chapter 12? And not sacrifice, ye would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. And then one last verse here in uh, chapter 23, verse 23. Tells us there, woe. Whenever you see that word woe and whenever Jesus is talking about woe, you better woe. And you better listen. It says, woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye pay tithe of mint and arise and, and come in and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Judgment, mercy, there's that word again, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you once again for another day you've allowed us to be here, Lord. I thank you for the services already that we've had today, Lord. I thank you for the songs that have been sung. And now, Father, I pray once again, Lord, that you would just use me as a tool in the carpenter's hand, Lord. I pray that we would realize, Father, these words, Father, had given to us, Lord, uh, not just to read over, but to apply them to our lives, Lord. And, Lord, you have touched my heart, Father, as I found my, time, my ways many times in my life as being a Pharisee or a scribe many times, Lord, having those ways in my life, Lord, willing to accept mercy but not willing to give mercy. But as I read your word here, Father, and I see the example that you set, Father, I'm to give mercy just like you give mercy. And, Lord, I pray now that you would speak to our hearts, move in a great and mighty way, Lord. And I just thank you now and just ask this all in Jesus' precious name. And amen and amen. Amen. Here we have just what read three different times all in the book of Matthew where our Savior here reproves, where our Savior rebukes this crowd of Pharisees for their lack of what? Their lack of that little word called mercy. And it's sad today that we have in our churches some of those same type of people that do not want to give mercy to other people, but they absolutely want to take the mercy. Amen on that. And I guess one of the attributes that we see in them is that they are very quick to show mercy on their own self, their own faults, their own uh, wrongdoings, their own shortcomings, and very quick to show mercy on their own failures there once again, but very hard and very slow and very long, you might say, in showing mercy to others who have the same failures and faults and shortcomings that they themselves have. We see that today. I, I, I bet I talk to preachers, pastors at least several weeks, and we hear the same thing coming around and about. Can I say to you this morning, if you think the Pharisees died out in the days of Jesus, when this here was penned, you are wrong this morning. If you think the Pharisees have been dissolved after the Gospels were with, with, uh, written, you would be a big wrong, and that is a big negative this morning. Do you hear me this morning? I can tell you this morning, I have run into a few Pharisees. I'm talking about holier than thou, Southern Baptists. Yes, I'm talking about that King James Bible. Walk right, talk right, never cuss, never drink, always tithe, always be in church every week. Baptist. I've been there because 
I was one of those in my own life. I've known and pastored some Pharisees in my day, and let's just be honest, there are times in all of our lives when we have all been, you might say, Pharisaical. I don't even know if that's a word. If it is, I just made it up then. But you get the point, don't you? You get the point. We've been pharisaical in some area of our life, trying to pull a piece of sawdust out of our brother and sister's eye while we ourselves walk around with an eight-by-eight eight cross tie sticking out of our own eye. Amen? We'll swallow a double hump Campbell, amen, yet staring at little bitty gnats that makes no difference whatsoever. We find ourselves in people within the church today that do that exact thing. That was the mark. That was the character of the Pharisees. They are hard at showing mercy to anyone but the person that they looked at in the mirror on a regular basis all the time. Amen? I know it'd be quiet. Sound familiar? Let me stop and say this, though. I'm so glad that the Lord that I serve, that the Jesus that I serve is not like the Pharisees. I'm so glad this morning that I serve a God of great mercy. And I wondered and I was thinking about this when I, why is he such a good and merciful God? Didn't nobody make him a God of mercy? He didn't need a preacher to make him a God of mercy. He didn't need a singer to make him a God of mercy. He didn't need some missionary to make him a God of mercy. He didn't even need the angels of heaven to tell him to be a God of mercy. But way back yonder, way back yonder in eternity, God looked down through time and he saw fallen men. He saw all Mike Garner would corrupt themselves down in sin and God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, that three-part God of heaven, raised their hand. Thank you, Lord, for that. Amen. Raised their hand and up and swore by their self because they can swear by none greater and if I don't have mercy on them bunch of sinners, guess what? They will die and go to a devil's hell without. And God said, my mercy will endure forever and ever, even unto all generations. You know the good thing about mercy? It supersedes generations. You know the good thing about mercy? It supersedes timelines. I'm thankful for that this morning. The Bible says it's forever and ever. How long is forever? Forever. Even in the midst of today, in the most wicked and immoral and sinful and ungrateful generation, even in this day, what we have today, the Lord's mercy is still stretched out. The Lord's mercy is still stretched out. His long arm of mercy is still giving good things to men and women and boys and girls and young people who do not deserve it today. Amen. You know what that old Webster's Dictionary says about this? You know, a lot. I was thinking about this. We got revision, revision, revision of all kind of books, don't we? But when you look back to the old uh, original here, Webster's Dictionary, the real deal, a lot of times I want the original when I, I'm reading books. These new revised and updated books and, and Bibles I, I, I put back on the shelf many times. Yes, I have different uh, versions of the Bible, but I love my old King James Bible. I do love it, but I do have different versions. I like the real deal. I don't even like 2% milk. I don't like skim milk. I like the good old red cap whole milk. That's what I like. That kind that clogs your arteries all the way down. And when we look at Webster's Dictionary, it says that mercy, listen to this, is that benevolence or compassion or fair forbearance shown especially to an offender or to one subject, to one's power. I appreciate mercy this morning. I'm thankful for mercy this morning. Grace, think about grace. Those songs that we sung about grace. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace is, is the unmerited favor of a great and glorious God this morning. It is God giving you something that you cannot earn and you do not deserve. But do you realize this this morning, that mercy is the opposite of grace. While grace, listen to me this morning, gives us something we do not deserve, mercy does not give us something we do deserve this morning. Amen. Mercy is the Lord withholding His wrath. Mercy is God withholding his justice. Mercy is uh, God withholding his anger. Thank you, Lord. 
and then giving us something that we never could get on our own. That's mercy. I heard people say, "Why? Well, well, God just ain't fair. I've heard that several times. God just ain't fair. Well, you better know this this morning. We better know this. From the pulpit to the back row back there, from the left side to the right side, we better be thankful that God absolutely ain't 100% fair because if he was ever last of one, including me starting up here, we would all be in hell for an eternity if he was fair. But here we are this morning. I don't know about you, but I got Jesus in my heart. I got a Bible up here that he's given me. You got one in your lap. We got scripture up there on the screen. Hallelujah. Heaven's our home and God is our Father and Jesus is our Savior. And we, and we know something about our Lord's mercy this morning. Can you say amen to that? Amen. And we find here in our Bibles in Matthew chapter 9 or Matthew chapter 9 and Matthew chapter 12, Jesus here, he quotes this same Old Testament passage on mercy twice. Uh, and, and did you see, and I hope that you noticed that when we was reading that. And he says the same thing there in chapter 9 and in chapter 12. And I will say anything that Jesus said is important. Would you say amen to that? Absolutely. There's nothing that Jesus ever said that was not important. I've said a lot of things that weren't important. But everything that Jesus said is very, very, very important, friend, this morning. There's nothing that Jesus ever said that was not important. Everything he ever spoke into existence was the inspired, infallible, heaven-sent, God-breathed words. And when Jesus said something once, pay attention, but... But when Jesus thinks of something enough to say it two times, turn up your hearing aids, clean out your wax in your ears, because he's about to drop a bomb on us this morning. Amen. I mean, if he thinks it's important enough here uh, to say it two times, we better get this uh, right. We better get it right. And also in studying this, I noticed something that Jesus quotes Hosea 6 and 6. He quotes there. Jesus says, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. What is interesting is, is when you look at Hosea 6 and 6, I noticed that Jesus, uh, and I think, intentionally misquoted the passage. He doesn't quote it like Jehovah does in Hosea 6 and 6. And if you go back to Hosea 6 and 6, if we've got it pulled up there, for I desired mercy. You see that word there, desired and not give? Do you notice that? Are you, are you awake this morning? Jehovah is talking to his people. And this is what uh, Jehovah said. He, there again, he doesn't say, I will have mercy. He says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And I wondered why did Jesus quote it differently in the New Testament. And, 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 and I, come, it showed me this. You know why? Jehovah was looking for someone to show mercy like he wanted mercy. Shown. He said, my desire is this. That some prophet, that some priest, that some king, that some saint. My desire is for somebody to show mercy like I want mercy shown. But, but, nobody could show mercy like God wanted mercy shown. Everybody could not measure up to the standard that God wanted his blessings of mercy to be shown. So Jesus came down in a body of flesh. Saying if you want something done right, you just got to do it yourself. Thank you, Jesus, for coming. And instead of saying, I desire mercy, he just said, I will have mercy. In other words, he said, I'll demonstrate mercy. I'll display mercy. And I ain't never met anybody who could show mercy and give mercy, friend, like Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I mean, the God of heaven that created man would hang on that old rugged cross, allow sinful man to, 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 to cuss him and mock him and beat him and spit on him. And yet while he hung on that cross, he would say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. My, my, that's mercy. I would say that, that there is real, plain, raw mercy defined. And I want to use Matthew 9 and 12 and 23 here to show just a few inches. We're going to move on where Jesus shows mercy. And I'm so thankful first and foremost that the Lord has mercy on sinners. That's the first point. I'm thankful this morning that the Lord has mercy on sinners. God has mercy on sinners. Look at Matthew 9 again in verse 9. The Bible says, And Jesus passed forth from thence. He saw a man named Matthew. And what was Matthew doing? He was sitting at the receipt of custom. 
We know here that Matthew, he is a tax collector. He is a uh, modern-day IRS agent here. And he saith unto him, What? Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And you know, Jesus has all kinds of mercy because right here he saves that IRS man. If he can save an IRS man, he can save anybody, can't he? I'm just kidding with you. If you're a tax collector in here, I'm just messing with you this morning. I'm the chief of the sinners, and he saved me. Verse 10, and it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came in and sat down with him and his disciples. And these Pharisees here, they saw him, they sat unto the disciples there. Why eateth your master with these publicans and sinners? Why? But when Jesus heard that, he didn't even let his disciples answer the question. He said, boys, I think I'll take this one myself. Thank you, Lord. They that behold me not a physician, but they that are sick, but go ye and learn what that meant. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners unto repentance. I don't know if you noticed that, but I noticed there are two crowds here that accuse the Lord of having mercy on them. One is this crowd of publicans. Now the publicans here were G Jews who went to work for Rome. They were traitors uh, to their own country. They would work for the Romans and, and collect taxes from their own people. And the Jews uh, hatred, uh, basically hated them because they seen them as traitors. And not only would they get taxes from their own people for, uh, for Rome, but they would also hike up the price uh, up so that, that they could, own, uh, you might say, line their own pockets. In other words, get some side money, you might say. Amen. I don't know a whole lot about that crowd, but the other crowd that accused the Lord of having mercy on was who? I know a little bit about this crowd. Uh, I was born in this crowd, and I know all about them. As a matter of fact, every one of us here know a good bit about this other crowd because we have all been born into that crowd. You say, what crowd is that, Mike? That's the crowd of the no good, you might say, sinner. Amen. You say, whoa, Mike, I know you ain't talking to me. Oh, yes, ma'am. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, yes, preacher Mike, who was all born in that crowd as a sinner. And if it wasn't for God's grace and God's mercy, friend, we wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't be headed for an eternal home. You ain't talking to me, Brother Mike. Yep, I am. See, before you got, got all pretty fired in the morning, you get up in the morning with your hair everywhere. Some of you do. I don't have to worry about that. You walk into the bathroom. You up early, have sleet in your eyes. Boogers in your nose. A green fog coming out of your mouth. Uh, the makeup ain't on just right. Before you look at all beautified, look into the mirror, you're looking at a sinner. I do it every morning when I wake up and go in there. There's a sinner there. Yes, sir, down at the core, that's what every one of us are this morning. You know, I wonder why the Lord never could show mercy on the Pharisees. I don't see anywhere in the Gospels here where Jesus was ever really about able to show mercy on, on a Pharisee. And the one that I find that, that comes closest there, it was Nicodemus. You remember Nicodemus, don't you? And Nicodemus never really got mercy from God. We, we never really see where Nicodemus got saved. He was the closest one. But they never got it, and I wonder why it is this morning, why they couldn't ever get mercy. And I'll tell you why, because they never saw themselves as a sinner, because the Pharisees saw themselves as pretty good. The Pharisees saw them as okay. The Pharisees saw themselves as, as keeping the law and, and all right. 
Can I just tell you this morning, if you see yourself as okay, if you see yourself as pretty good and all right, you are a, not a candidate for the mercy of Jesus Christ this morning. You say, well, who is a candidate for mercy? Well, I'm glad you asked that this morning. It's those who fall on the mercy of the Lord and say, oh, Lord, I'm just an old rotten sinner, and I know I deserve a devil's hell, and I know that's where I ought to go, but, God, I don't want to go. Lord, save me. Lord, I need you. I come to you, Father, and drop on my knees and cry out to you, Lord. Lord, save me. I need you, Jesus. Those are the ones. Those are the ones that come with a humble heart, with a clean heart, with a desire to serve the Lord. Those are the ones that are the candidates for the mercy of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for his mercy. Amen. True story. Back in the Depression, I, some of you may have lived in the Depression. Judge LaGuardia. A man by the name of Judge LaGuardia, remember that name, said that one day while LaGuardia was in court carrying on his judge's duty, during, that great, during the Great Depression, they brought a man in for stealing bread to feed his family. They walked that man in, told the charge before Judge LaGuardia. Judge looked at him and said, Son, the fine is $10 or 30 days in jail. He said, how do you plead? The man said, I plead guilty. I plead guilty. Your Honor, I'm guilty. He said, I have a wife and I have several kids to feed. He said, if I would have had the money, I would have never, never, never stole the bread. Never. He said, Your Honor, times are hard and I lost my job. And Judge, I, I, I didn't have a dollar in my pocket and I'm guilty. And I took the bread, Your Honor. The judge looked at him and said, I, I feel terrible for you, son. I feel sorry for you, son. But the law says this. Either you pay the fine of $10 or you're going to jail for 30 days. What do you take? He said, Your Honor, I don't have any money, not a dime on me. I guess I'll have to take the 30 days in jail. The court, he slammed the gavel down. He said, Bailiff, take him away. True story. True story. But it don't end there. See, it didn't end at Calvary either. Hmm. They said the judge, when the bailiff was walking out, took his robe off, walked out of his quarters, stepped down, went to the bailiff, pulled out his billfold. Here's the $10. I'm going to pay his fine. If you don't get nothing else, get something out of this. Said so he turned around, put his robe back on, come up in the court, up on the, where he was at, sued the court for $50 for allowing a man to live in a town that wouldn't even help a man when his family was starving. That he had to steal. So he fined the court $50, took up a collection in the court of $47.50. And the man went home with $97.50 in his pocket. True story. He had compassion on him. He had mercy on him. Amen. And the man walked out with $97.50, free as a bird. Hey, I'm saying I remember the time on a warm April night at Antioch Baptist Church in Golston. And God said, you're guilty. And you're bankrupt. And you ain't got no way of paying your debt, son, of sin. How you plead. And I'm here to tell you this morning, how do you plead? I said, God, 
come to the altar. Let go of that pew, and I walk that aisle. I'm guilty, Lord. But I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to be eternally separated from you. I don't want to be eternally separated from my grandparents. They have told me all about you and what I needed to do to receive you. But I'm thankful, Lord, for the sweet Holy Spirit of conviction tonight, Lord. And, Lord, you never gave up on me when others did. That I had a praying grandma and a praying mama and a praying daddy that never gave up on me. And, Lord, thank you for allowing me that one more time to make it right. You know what he said? He said, well, somebody else paid the fine, son. Woo! Somebody else paid the debt. It was a big cost. You see, I sent my son to that cross for you. His name is Jesus. And my son paid in, their, in his own blood for sinners like you, Mike. So you could have mercy. And so you could have grace. And I come to you this morning to tell you, you can have that same Jesus. I'm thankful for that marvelous mercy and grace. I'm thankful for that grace this morning. Amen. That's how it happened for me. And let me say this morning, there's nobody too far gone. There's no life too deep in sin. There's no soul so dirtied up by the devil and by your past, by the world and by sin that Jesus can't pull his sleeve up and reach down with his mighty arm of mercy and pull you out of that miry clay and pull you out of that life and pick you up and clean you off and make you something in Jesus this morning. Amen. And maybe you've got that loved one that you keep saying, I don't know, I don't keep praying, keep giving it to the Lord. Don't give up on them because I am a testimony that died. my mom and those never gave up on me. Jesus wants all to go be with him. He has mercy on the sinners today. Ain't you glad? That means I qualify. I'm a candidate. Not only does he have mercy on sinners, but it even gets better. Look at Matthew chapter 12. We'll move right on along here. The Lord has mercy on the saints. He has mercy on the saints this morning. And let me just take a minute and get this on out of me this morning. I realize that brothers and sisters really don't have a lot of mercy on the saints. But the Lord has a lot of mercy on the saints. I've been around Christian brothers and sisters a good while now. And so many times, some who have the chance to get over on somebody and knock them down, they will do it. And they will not show no mercy. But listen to me. The Lord will show you mercy. Right here in this chapter 12, and the meaning in, this, this, in verse 1 there. And at that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn. You see that? And his disciples were in hunger and began to pluck the ears of corn and eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. Let me stop there and just say this. If you are a constant, outspoken, troublemaking accuser of a brother and sister in this church or any other church, you have sided yourself with the devil and the Pharisees. People don't like to hear that. But that's the fact of the matter. Amen? You cited yourself with the Pharisees here in this passage. A picture we see of the devil. You see that, don't you? They accuse the brethren, the brethren here to, to the Lord. Ain't that what the Bible said? The devil, the devil does that. He is the accuser of the brethren. And I would say if your only reason for being in church or in any other time, whether it's this church or any other church around in this community, if the only reason you're here on Sundays and Wednesdays and for business meetings and any other activities is to criticize and to poke at holes and tear down and try to accuse people of this and that, then you have sided up and signed up with Satan himself. It shouldn't be that way. We're here as a church family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And all the nonsense gets tied up in all everything else when it shouldn't have anything to do with that. I've seen several plants of the devil in many church houses before. 
And the only reason that they were there were to try to accuse and to criticize everything that went on. Listen to me, Jesus has no toleration for such as that kind of mess. Look what he does here. He ch basically, he chops the knees off here of these Pharisees with the Bible. And let me say something right quick. Pharisees hate the Bible because Pharisees don't live the Bible. They live their own scriptures. They live their own way they think or see, think seem to be right. Hey, listen, it don't matter what I think and what, what, I, what I think about it. It's what God thinks about it and what he says about it. And I've got to live my life according to his word. Amen? But they don't like that. They don't like They make their own scripture and commandments. Up. They don't uh, live the Bible doctrine. They make uh, up their own standards and conviction and try to make uh, you think that they uh, are holy. But they are not Bible standards. That's what we need to live by. Amen? And I'll just throw this on out there. A lot of these pharisaical things sounds like a lot of the bylaws that you put in churches today. We're more concerned about bylaws than we are God's law. And it shouldn't be that way. And yes, we should have that. We should have it, absolutely. But when you start to worry more about that than you do what God's Word says, then you just got a problem. Because God's law trumps any of man's laws. I don't care who you are or where you're at. They get upset here and they get mad. Look, look at what he says in verse 6. Have you not read? No, they didn't read. And if they did, they didn't care about what they were reading. And many people today in church don't care about what they're reading. I come to church, I check the box, I've done good. Y'all, come by y'all, let's go home. We're going to give an account for the Lord, friend. Every one of you. Start with me. You see that? What David did when he was yet at hun uh, hungered, and that, that they were with him, uh, how he entered into the house of God and did eat the sh uh, showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priest. You see that there? Are you with me this morning? I love verse 7 there too. Where Jesus is speaking. But if ye had known what this meant, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Ye would, ye would not have condemned the guiltless. Do you see that? They're guilty. That's what it said. They're, they ain't guilty. They are guilty. What are they? According, if you really look at that, according to the strict laws in the Old Testament, I'm talking about those strict laws that we find in Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. According to them uh, books, these disciples, these disciples here, were they guilty or not? When you look at the passage, yes. Guilty is charged. Guilty uh, when you go back over in the Old Testament. When you go back over in the book uh, in Numbers chapter 15, if you want to write that down, you can read it later. We may even have it up here. Numbers chapter 15, there it is right there. It says, and while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. Verse 33, And they, they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and to the congregation. Now here's a man just gathering sticks. Remember that. And they put him in, in ward, in other words, in jail, resting, because it was not declared what should be done to him. And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. Do you see that there? So here's a man here who was caught on the Sabbath here. Picking up sticks. He wasn't building a house. He wasn't building a fence. He was just picking up sticks. Uh, don't seem too much to it to me as I was studying this. But as he was picking up sticks, there he is. They called him. They put him in jail. And they asked uh, the Lord, our Lord, well, what do we do with this uh, Sabbath breaker? And the Lord said, stone him. Uh, just like that, no mercy at all. So how is that this guy here in the Old Testament, he got the rocks, and these guys in the New Testament uh, are probably worse than this other guy because not only are they picking corn on the Sabbath here, it ain't even their corn. It ain't even their corn and they're picking it. It's somebody else's corn that they're picking. Double law breaking, double law breaking. And here Gomer Pyle now hollering at. Why did this guy over here 
get the rocks, and these guys over here, you might say, get excused or pardoned. I mean, Scripture says that they were guiltless. You know what? It was, had nothing to do with their... I'm going somewhere with this, so just stick with me. It had nothing to do with either party. The first thing that probably went through your mind was that guy over there was probably got stoned because he was a bad, and these guys over here got mercy because they are good. Did you think that? Good people don't get mercy. It's not a thing about good and bad. You say, well, why did this guy here get stoned and these guys got mercy? It has nothing to do, listen to me, with either guilty party. It has to do with who these guys are with at the time they commit the deed. Well, who are, are they walking with, Mike? They're walking with the one who is the advocate with the Father. They are walking with the one that justifies sinners. This morning, guess what? His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Smile out there a little bit. Smile a little bit this morning. His name is Jesus. Can I say something? Uh, men, uh, on your best day living for God. Ladies, on your best day living for God. I mean, on that day you did everything just right. You went to church. You witnessed uh, for the Lord. You prayed. You tithed. You didn't kick your dog that day. You didn't holler at your husband or your wife. The day, the days you did everything just right. And even though you did that, you didn't inherit not one foot into the pearly gates. We can be as good as we can be, and we still not, will not inherit the kingdom of the Lord. On our best day, the Lord still sh uh, should have sent us to hell. So how are we not going this morning? How are we? How come if, I, if something would happen to me right now in this pulpit, that when I take my last breath here, I'll take my first breath in heaven with my Lord and Savior? It has nothing to do with me or what I have done. It has to do with who is living inside of me. It has to do with who's living inside of me, Brother Wayne. Who's living inside of you this morning, I ask? Only you can answer that. It has, has to do with who I'm walking with, with who dwells in me, that one that sticks closer than a brother, that one that will never leave me nor forsake me. It has to do with his righteousness. It has to do with his mercy. It has to do with his grace this morning. And not my own. Amen. Amen. Quit letting the old devil beat you up over the past things in your former life. Did you hear me this morning? Quit letting the devil beat you up over the former things that went on in your life. Quit letting the devil drag you down in past things of yesterday. If it's under the blood, live alive, live happy, live joyous, and know that you are forgiven and, and you've got mercy through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's why we should be the happiest people. We should have smiles on our face every Sunday morning as we walk into the God house. Not come in here to praise. Come bring your praise with you when you come here. Amen. I'm almost done. I heard a belly growl. But I pray you're saved this morning. Thank God for the great mercy for sinners and for his saints this morning. I come across, I like reading a lot of stuff. I come across another story. This is also true. Uh, I noticed they've I come across it talked about they're doing a lot of shepherding now over in New Zealand. They said at times in the year when it comes time for the mama lambs there to give birth to those babies, a lot of times the mama, uh, those babies will be uh, stillborn or the, the, of course, they'll be dead. They would come out and, and, and have them, and, and they wouldn't be alive. And then sometimes those mamas would die giving birth to the babies. In other words, leaving them a little orphaned. And they, they would be without a baby. And, they, and the story went on, and it says, and they tried to figure out how, how to get the baby lambs with no mama to be accepted into a family. To have the mama accepted, they said they would take a little orphan lamb and stick it into the family. But the only problem with that, when they stuck that little lamb into that new family was, the mama uh, would stick her nose up. In other words, push it away or, or run, you know, just do away with it. If you ever raised cattle or been around stuff like that, we used to have that happen. We'd always take the calf, wash it in the, the, the milk, you might say, of the one we wanted to give the calf to, and, it's, and she would accept that so many times. But they would bend down and smell that. It goes on to say, and smell that baby. And when, and when she smells that new baby, she realizes it's not the smell of her own. 
It's the smell of a stranger. And she would uh, run the little lamb back in, into the field. And without her milk and care, guess what? What would it do? It would die. It would die in the cold. So they tried to come up with a way to try to get the, these uh, mothers to take in the orphan babies. They said they would do what, uh, what they would do. They would actually take uh, uh, the stillborn babies that were birthed and died and skin the coat off of that dead baby and take that still dripping with blood coat and lay it on the back of that little scared orphan lamb and then push it into that mother that had lost her baby. Interesting. And now when that little lamb comes back in and the mama leans down and smells, no longer is it the smell of a stranger. No longer is it the smell of an orphan. But now it's the smell of one of her own. It's her own blood she smells. It's her own coat she smells. And she takes it into the family and gives it the love and nourishment that it needs and lets it live as one of her own babies. And I share that to share that with to tell you this. And that's exactly what happened to me. On Calvary's cross, God gave his son. Just like his lamb was skint, you could say that Jesus was skint. He was beaten. He, he was crucified. The perfect lamb here. And God took his righteousness and put it on my back. And now when I come before the presence of my father... When I come into the throne room, brother, uh, listen, brother, he takes a good whiff. You know that. But he smells the lily of the valley and the bright morning star. And he says, come on in. Not on Mike's merits. Not on my goodness. Not being in church every week. Not on what I've done, but because of the good and great mercy of his son this morning, Jesus Christ. That's mercy. That's mercy. Thank God he has mercy on sinners. Thank God he has mercy on the saints, his children. And lastly, we close in Matthew 23. Flip over right quick and we'll move right on. Verse 23. Matthew 23 and verse 23. And we close out with this right here. It says, Woe! Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and arise and come in and have uh, omitted the, uh, the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. Do you see that? Because he has had mercy on sinners and because he has had mercy on his children, the saints, listen to me, God deserves uh, us to show mercy in our service for him also. It's not just enough to be the receiver, the beneficiary, you might say, of mercy. God wants us to give out a little bit of mercy. Are you getting a picture this morning? I pray that you are. Notice here in Matthew 23 and 23. Listen, this is possibly, I would think, that one of the most roughest messages that has ever been preached at any time on this earth. You might say, I've heard some rough preaching. You ain't heard any to, until we read this right here. This is tough. We see Jesus here. He's mad. Uh, he, he's in a sense, he could be red out here. He's done flipped over tables in the synagogue, and Jesus looks at this crowd. And, and it's one thing to preach against people when they ain't in, uh, you might say, in your family or in, in your congregation. Preachers are real good at preaching against liberals here and liberals there. But they ain't, you know, they ain't never there when you preach it or preach about it. They're somewhere else. But Jesus looks right at this crowd. He's preaching here at, at, at they're sitting right there. And he calls the, their name and, and says, you're a viper. That's in verse 33 of that same chapter. You're a viper. You're a snake. That's pretty stout there. That's pretty brave there. And I'm sure they don't teach you. I know they don't teach you that in seminary, that you're going to build up your congregation, your tithers of your church by calling them snakes and vipers. You ain't going to win that. That's pretty rough. And let me say this. Jesus is not this little 110-pound Feniman guy on the media today that he's, that they tried to portray him as. This is a full-grown, 33-and-a-half-year-old carpenter man from Galilee 
This is the man. This is the perfect man that was sent from God the Father. This is Christ Jesus. Jesus was the manliest man that has ever lived. You want, to be, you want a man to pattern your uh, lives after young men? Huh? I do. You don't need a superhero. You don't need a sports hero. You don't need a TV hero. You want a real man to pattern your life after a real man? That's Jesus Christ. That's who we all need to pattern our life by. Don't, don't look at somebody and measure your life by them. Measure it according to Jesus Christ. And then we'll see where we're really at. The greatest man to ever live, Jesus. And Jesus starts to preach and hear to this crowd in verse 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites. And when Jesus says, woe, you better stop and listen. For you, know, for you paid tithe the men and... and and, and we see there in coming and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. And let me just say one thing here. If you think you've reached the height of your Christianity because you tithe, you're a Pharisee. I believe in tithe and I believe you ought to tithe. I believe if you don't tithe, you're robbing God. I believe it's a biblical man. I believe that. He gives us everything. Why can't we give him a little something back? It's all his to begin with. Amen? But if you think that you're better and higher up Christian because you tithe, or that's pharisaical. There's that word again. There are bigger things in Christian life than tithing. There's harder things to do than tithe. Jesus said that there are weightier matters of the law. In other words, there's harder things to do than tithe. I have found out in my own life sometimes it's easier to give money than mercy. You know that? A lot of times we try to buy it, don't we? You can't do that. Sometimes it's a lot easier to do everything else you can do other than giving mercy to someone we really don't want to give mercy to. Look at what Jesus says here. You have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, discernment, mercy, and faith. These all ye have done, and not to leave the other undone. He said, you ought to do both. He's saying here, the problem is uh, we're not showing mercy in our, in our service. Listen to me. Giving mercy does, does not mean you're being weak. It doesn't mean you're being a salty. It means you're being like Jesus when you give that mercy. And I'm commanded to do that. My brother may have hurt me bad. But I've hurt God a whole lot worse. And I need to go to him or go to her and give her that same mercy that God's bestowed upon me. Amen. You remember what, what Webster's Dictionary said mercy was? It's only exercised towards offenders. The muscle of mercy don't, does not even begin to be exercised until you flex it towards somebody that has offended you, that has done you wrong. You say, well, I'm merciful. Have you showed anybody today that's rubbed you wrong this morning? Huh? Have you showed them mercy? Oh, me. You say, I ain't giving them mercy. Uh, they don't deserve it. Listen, it's not, it's not mercy if they deserve it. Do you know that? You say, if they get, get right with me, I, I will give them mercy. You know when God started showing mercy on you and me? God commended his love toward us that while we were yet good, no. Nah. While we were yet Bible believers, no. Nah. While we was uh, coming to church on a regular basis, no. Nah. Going to church every week. Crossing all our I's, our, our T's. Getting all our I's and putting our periods there. That ain't when it started. And while we were yet what? Sinners. Sinners. He died for us. That's when mercy started. God's mercy started in my life and your life before we ever got born again. As a matter of fact, his mercy started over 2,000 years ago. And I would say this, a whole, a whole lot of mercy there, friend. It's easy for us to enjoy the first two points here of this message. You know why? It's easy to shout an amen when we're the beneficiaries or we receive. Receivers, point one. Point two, uh, we are sinners. We are saints. We are his children. And the Lord pours his mercy out on us. Thank you, Lord. 
But on this last point, no longer does Jesus pour out his mercy on me, but expects me to pour out mercy to others. And not only me this morning, friend, he expects each and every one of us in here to call ourselves a born-again believer, a follower of Jesus Christ, to give mercy. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and the Lord has run somebody through your mind right now that you need some mercy from. Or maybe that you need to give some mercy to. But God, you, you don't know what they did to me. You don't know what my wife did. You don't know what my husband did. I, I don't need to know what they did. All I asked was that you show a little mercy. If you were in their shoes, you would want some mercy. Maybe this morning it would be good if Cindy comes to just slip out and come to this altar. Bow down say, Lord, thank you for your mercy. I'm thankful that every morning his mercies are new. And if they are new every day, we need to be thanking him every day that we didn't and don't get what we deserve. And we see the example here. I don't want to be pharisaical, and I don't want to be a Pharisee. I want to be by my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as he gives me mercy every day, his mercy endureth forever. I want to be that one to give that mercy also as an example of Christ Jesus. Do you this morning? Do you this morning as we all stand? Father, we do thank you once again for another day. You've allowed us to be here, Lord. I thank you for everyone that came this morning, Father. Father, they're not here by coincidence. Father, they are here at an appointed time to hear the song and hear the message. And I pray today, Father, whatever is burdened that heart this morning, whereas they need to give mercy to someone that's done them wrong or where they desire mercy from somebody that's hurt them. I mean, either way, Father, I pray that you move in a great mighty way as this altar's open. Father, is there one here today, Lord, I pray, Lord, that has never received you as our personal Savior. As we just seen there, as Jesus give her an example, he's saying the doctor, the physician, listen, the well, they, they don't need a physician. It's those that are sick. And we see in Scripture there that he comes to the sinners and the publicans. As I said before, my crowd, the sinners. It didn't matter what I'd done in my past, where I'd been, how I'd lived. What mattered was that I was, had decided through that sweet Holy Spirit of conviction that I was going to listen to that call of the voice of God telling me, Mike, you are in a need of a Savior, son. And son, if you deny me or reject me today, friend, it may be the last time that I call upon you. And that means if you do not receive me, live for me in obedience and according to my word, you will totally, totally, totally be separating me from me and damned for eternity. Lord, don't want that. Lord, don't want that. Father, move in a great and mighty way, and we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen and amen. As the altar's full,
all of God's children said Amen. ain't you thankful for God's mercy Amen. Amen and I'm thankful he's allowed us another day that we can show some mercy hallelujah to the Lamb of God thank y'all love y'all continue to pray appreciate each and everyone's thoughts and prayers uh, just remember tonight service at 6 o'clock special music be uh, bluegrass they'll have all the live instruments I think so just remember that uh, so be in much prayer for that service invite someone all hearts cleared know that I love you but more important our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ loves you Bible study continues uh, this uh, Wednesday night, once again, why did Jesus come? We'll be looking at something else there also. You know, I think about this altar being in praying. You know, one of these days, sometimes people get impatient in church. They look at their watch. But always remember this, just by the grace of God, you could be that next one down here that needs prayer. And we all should show patience and all show to pay, pay respect in, in, in God's house. Amen. Amen. I ain't worried about going nowhere. I'm just worried about doing God's will. And, and being with God's people and praying with God's people because it's just by the grace of God it, it could be one of us next time here. Amen? Amen. All hearts cleared? All right. Brother uh, Wayne Wilma, if you would dismiss us. <laughs>